Yes, yes, you heard it right. Yell it, scream it, holler from the rooftops, the great trollers of Ohio, the biomass, are back once again to terrorize the After the Flash community. You already know how these things go. Uh, a new guide comes out, uh, I read it, I give my opinion on it afterwards, and um, that's about it, yeah. So uh, let's start. Sorry, future editor Mushroom Man here. Um, as I was recording this, I just looked at my YouTube notifications, and there was this one guy who commented th this comment uh, that says, Hey, I respect your opinion, but here's what I think Wintertide is. Basically, an alt timeline set in the more sci-fi sense of narrative, but trying to keep with the older games, because Wintertide is able to have the older factions in the game from what i can tell due to people creating custom factions i wish you well mushroom what what did he mean by this <laughs> all right that that's about it enjoy the video after the flash wintertide biomass guide Last updated, July 6th, 2024. Background. South Point State has declared war on humankind, unleashing a bioweapon of biblical proportions upon the Sunrise Isles. For the first time ever, the mutant disease has made a jump to humans. The biomass, as it has come to be known, has found its new home in the Black Caverns. It is a repulsive and fleshy substance that will eat everything in its way, whether it is biological matter or otherwise. It spreads a spore that has the ability to inflict humans with feral mutinism. Previously healthy wastelanders are falling ill to this new infection, slowly but surely morphing them into husks of their former selves, zombie-like bodies that do nothing but spread the biomass infection. The biomass. The biomass takes root in the form of a blight. Plants, fungi, and all other biological matter are drained of their nutrients to feed a repulsive and fleshy substance that expands in their stead. In terms of appearance, it is almost indistinguishable from a non-infectious stasis pod, with one exception being its gargantuan size in comparison. Furthermore, biomass nests typically have massive tendrils the size of logs, slithering around at a very slow pace. The biomass also releases airborne spores that will cause respiratory failure in animals and, in humans, infection. The biomass seems to be impervious to fire with direct flame contact doing nothing but charring the surface and agitating nearby biomass mutants. The biomass also seems to be incredibly resistant to gunfire, with most calibers up to, and including, 50 caliber doing nothing to damage the biomass growth. Note, biomass mutants are still susceptible to flamethrowers and gunfire, as the biomass growth on them is not thick enough to provide protection from either of the aforementioned weapon types. Infection air. Airborne spores from biomass and decomposing biomass eldritch are a potential hazard for non-infected. Infection from airborne spores can be as quick as a few seconds to minutes, depending on the exposure levels. Spores may be blocked by wearing gas masks with filters around biomass-contaminated areas and bodies. Spores released by biomass can clog up gas mask filters within 5 to 15 minutes, depending on concentration. Bites, scratches, and bodily fluids. Bites, scratches, and other physical attacks by biomass eldritch may lead to infection if the skin is broken. Blood and sweat may cause infection if it comes into direct contact with the eyes, mouth, or open wounds. Direct skin contact with biomass necks almost guarantees infection, especially the tendrils and spore sacs. In very rare cases, prolonged direct skin contact with a biomass eldritch may also lead to infection. Note. Infection through biting and scratching requires permission to cripple, as it can lead to amputations and very fast infection. Food and water. The biomass can infect food items, which, upon ingesting, may lead to infection. The biomass is also known to survive in bodies of water, but only for a few days. Treatment. Treatment of biomass infection varies between the methods of exposure. Compound Red, originally produced by South Point State, seems to be quite effective at curing biomass if used during the incubation stage. Whereas it produces notable side effects when used by mutants attempting to stave off eldritchism, it has no observable side effect when used to cure biomass. 
at least not the first time that the biomass is cured with compound red. Alternative treatments to biomass infection include the amputation of limbs, but this can only be done in the event of a bite or scratch, and should only be done as a last resort. First dose. Immediately cures biomass infection in both mutants and humans. Only works if injected during the incubation stage. The skin will have a deep red tone around the injection spot, resembling a sunburn, for a couple of weeks afterwards. Second dose. If a wastelander is so unfortunate to be infected with biomass twice, they are treated with compound red again. Their skin pigmentation will permanently adopt a deep red hue. Third dose. While rare, a third treatment with compound red and beyond will begin to afflict motor function and give the user serious mental issues, further outcasting them from society. Airborne infection can only be treated with compound red in the incubation stage. Bodily fluids infection can only be treated with compound red in the incubation stage. Bites and scratches can be treated by amputating limbs or with compound red in the incubation stage. Food or water infection can be treated by inducing vomiting or with compound red in the incubation stage. Stages. Stage zero, exposure. Happens immediately after exposure to the biomass. At this stage, there are no signs of infection. Stage one, incubation, zero to 14 days. A period of time between exposure to biomass and initial symptoms showing up. Depending on the method of exposure, it can vary from a few minutes to several weeks, depending on how much biomass the host is exposed to. A bite on the neck may infect the host in just 30 to 60 minutes, whereas a bite on the limbs may take several days before the disease progresses. Below is a table with guiding references on how long the disease takes to spread. Infection method. Airborne. Exposure to spores. Ground zero nest. Direct contact. Bite on neck. Time to feral, 30 to 60 minutes. Time to eldritch, 7 to 9 days. Airborne. Exposure to spores. Direct contact. Bite on torso. 12 to 24 hours to feral, 9 to 14 days to eldritch. Direct contact, bodily fluids, bite on limbs. Food and water, ingesting contaminated food or water. Time to feral, 1 to 3 days. Time to eldritch, 14 to 30 days. Airborne, exposure to contaminated bodies. Direct contact, scratches. 7 to 14 days to feral, 30 days or more to eldritch. At the incubation stage, the infected will begin to develop flu-like symptoms. The infection will begin to weaken the immune system, making the host susceptible to other diseases. At this point, the host may be exposed to vomiting, headaches, nausea, coughing, sneezing, fatigue, hallucinations, fever, and extreme night terrors. If an infected with the biomass receives a dose of compound red before the infection progresses to the next stage, they will be cured. Stage 2, feral, 0 to 30 days. This picture represents a group of ferals shambling aimlessly into the depths of Biomass Ground Zero, or the Black Caverns. When the biomass is done incubating, the host will progress to the next stage of the infection. This stage can last anywhere from a few days to a month, depending on the method of infection. Fine motor functions will rapidly deteriorate over the course of a few hours, leading to those infected shambling around like rabid animals. Biomass will begin to grow on the feral, with red glowing cysts and blood-red flesh-like substances developing in their skin. At the feral stage, the host will begin to unwillingly spread biomass through violence, attacking anyone that is not infected with punches, scratches, and bites, all while attempting to resist the disease that is taking control of their own bodies. It is not uncommon to see ferals punching themselves in the head, ripping out their own hair, or even screaming in despair while aimlessly shambling around the wasteland. Ferals start with their motor functions intact, but these quickly deteriorate by the hour. When they turn, they can hold items such as bottles, weapons, and even guns, but they lack the ability to aim. They can also open doors and mumble random sentences, but these functions are lost after a few days of infection. Ferals will continue to blurt out random words and mumble even in the later stages of ferility, pleading for mercy, begging to be put down, or yelling for help as they attack non-infected wastelanders which has led to some theorizing that the host is still conscious and trying to resist infection. Stage 3, Eldritch, 7 to 30 days. When ferals have been nearly fully engulfed by the biomass, the host body will find a resting place before it enters stasis, a process that is identical to naturally occurring eldritches. The only difference between biomass and regular eldritch is that biomass eldritch leave behind a biomass nest, 
when their cocoon has been broken, allowing the biomass to spread further. For more information on Eldritch, please refer to the Eldritch Guide. Frequently Asked Questions, FAQ. If questions are asked quite frequently, they will be added here to clarify things that may otherwise seem unclear. Thank you, I did not know that. Can mutants get infected by biomass? Answer, yes, mutants can get infected with biomass. It infects them at the same way that it would a human, with one exception being that mutants are very resistant to biomass spores. They can breathe in spores for up to 5 to 15 minutes without wearing a gas mask before they get infected, thus eliminating the need for natural-born mutants to wear one. Additionally, mutants feel a call of the void when near biomass, which they must consciously fight. Half-breeds do not get the call of the void. Question. Do biomass eldritch attack non-biomass eldritch? Answer. Yes, but only to afflict them with the biomass. Eldritch are very territorial to begin with, so pitting a biomass eldritch against a non-affected eldritch would probably lead to some issues down the line. Question. Can biomass infect droids? Answer. Yes, but only indirectly. Spores can clog and short-circuit certain electronic parts inside of a droid, which can lead to the droid acting erratically. This is known as rot, and is described more in depth in the technology guide. How do biomass eldritch react to droids? Answer. As droids are mechanical beings and not carbon-based life forms, biomass mutants will generally avoid droids, unless otherwise provoked into a fight, such as through territorial conquest or being attacked. Question. Is the biomass a hive mind? Answer. Yes and no. Generally, biomass mutants will only respond to the biomass being threatened if they manage to grow a mini biomass tendril on their body, which acts as a short-range antenna to the nearest biomass nest. It is not rare, but also varies heavily between mutants whether they get this biomass tendril sprouting on their body. To keep it short and sweet, they will only react to the biomass being attacked if they are in the vicinity. How do random attack or automatic permission to kill rules work with biomass mutants? Answer. Mutants may initiate an attack, but must still adhere to all ATF rules. The person on the receiving end of the attack decides the combat type, and they will automatically have automatic permission to server kill on the offending mutant. Moreover, biomass mutants require permission to cripple to bite, scratch, or otherwise infect wastelanders with biomass. Can a carrier spread biomass when they are in the incubation stage? Answer, yes. In fact, this is when it is most contagious. The infection will spread through bodily fluids, so a simple cough or sneeze in someone's face might just be enough to infect them with biomass. Question, answer, question, answer. And that is the end of the guide. Uh, it's actually pretty short, just around six pages. Uh, my opinion on it is, I'm talking unscripted here, I think this is a good step. I actually think that they did this pretty well, um, and I appreciate the fact that there is now a common enemy, and a lot of the points that I brought about bringing Rad X back, you know, have been made. Uh, I still like the pr uh, more advanced progression system uh, that Rad X had, but I feel like this sort of easier to understand and follow system can work for just Wintertide. But by the next game, I hope they expand on this a little bit more. Uh, but for now, this is this is a very good step, uh, and I appreciate it. And it just makes the world of Wintertide, which didn't really feel that dangerous before, it, it just gives that, that little extra fear factor. Uh, some things that I really like, uh, the whole, like, screaming and the fact that they like internally they uh they're still conscious or like the theory that they're still conscious and that they're like self-destructive is i mean that's just cool as shit i i have to be fully honest that's just awesome um uh, i believe that the last of us zombies at the very like first part of infection were like that too which is just so cool i uh may or may not have had something to do with the um the uh mutant changes and additions <clears throat> no, I, I mean, I probably had a very small influence on it by making my point in the retrospective video. But, um, so yeah, uh, pretty good, pretty good. I dig it.